And so I was at this phase, having had wonderful education and and four different jobs at two years each, doing wonderful things very successfully. So, but that was that was success of my mind and success of my body. My soul was still very, very confused about what is my life purpose and why am I here? With all this privilege and doing whatever I want, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Hi, I am Lewis Briggs in my first of three near-death experiences in which here in Berkeley, California, although it could have happened anywhere, uh, I totaled my automobile and, in an accident and my soul went high speed through what we call the tunnel, out of my body, out of the car, I was sent high speed all the way to the end of the tunnel into what I call the source of all energy, all light, all love, all consciousness, knowledge of everything. That was pretty amazing <laughs> since none of us has that here on me. So I understood immediately that we are all one. And I understood immediately that when this soul that comes from this source of energy enters our body, we no longer are just all one. We are all one and we become uniquely different here on Earth. Not a conflict, they are both true. You and I are one. And we are uniquely different. We are each in the only DNA in the history of life on Earth. And therefore, we have all of our own life experiences that start to change us more and more and more and give us all of our learnings. And all of our learnings come from what we call the greatest crisis, the greatest crises you know, that we have ever had, even if it's trauma. So there I was in that light, just feeling like, this is amazing. And then, unlike some others, I had a voice to me. That voice said to me, Lewis, you are called here to have this conversation and to be sent back because you are not doing your work. And my answer was, well, then take me. I am yours. I will do your work. Thinking I was being called to be a Christian missionary to, of course, teach you who were not raised Christian. I was told, no, Lewis, it is not my work you must do. It's your work. And I said, well, what is my work? I didn't know, remember? In my history, I told you I could do whatever I wanted. But I still didn't know my life's purpose. And so the question was perfect. Because its words were, what is it, Lewis, that keeps you from being, not doing, being all you are capable of being? I didn't know. So I said, let me think. Uh, the only thing I can imagine is that because I was raised with such privilege and education and love, and because my parents said, we are all one under God, there was no problem. But it was when they said, after they said, we are all one under God, when they said, you are special. 
that bothered me. I did not get arrogant about that. I thought, what do you mean if we're all one under God? And so now I know what she what they meant was because I had such privilege and was so educated and so free and so healthy that I needed to use that privilege to serve. I needed um, to give back in some and I did not know what way I was supposed to serve with that privilege. And so I said in my answer that the only thing I am aware of is that in my entire life, I never learned how to do any of the bridging to build a relationship. So I was immediately set back down without another word. I had no idea what was going to happen. But what did start to happen was doors started to open that I had nothing to do with. That was a big learning for a privileged white boy in North America. So after 20 years of doing the work very successfully, because I now know I was called not only to be the spirit behind the doing, about why I am doing this work. It was very successful. I became a speaker. We had many videos. We did workshops, seminars, created the National Diversity Conference. But after 20 years, hmm, what else did I have to learn? Well, there came a day when uh, another one of my learnings from an open door was that I had a daughter when she graduated from a recovery school at age 15, after two years of this that she needed, I said, right. So as we were going down the river, and my 10-year-old son was looking terrified on the fast water that was starting, I looked at him and said, trust me. And so we all now smile about those words, trust me. Because the next thing I'm going to tell you I have no memory of. Okay? A 100 foot tall tree fell off the edge of the river and landed on my head and on my son's head. It missed my daughter. It fractured my son's skull and he was drowned, I was told, in the bottom of the raft. He's okay now. Even though I was still lying there with blood and fractured skull and everything. And I was feeling, where's my son? Where's my son? And then I was able to just sense that he was alive. And now that I don't have to worry about that either, I could start thinking about, well, then how am I going to recover? And so the learning I got there is I want us all to understand that when we are in a crisis, mind, the body, and the spirit, the soul, We'll do everything possible to try to survive. Everything. Because that's our intuition, okay? And then the other amazing learning came from when I started the first week of three years of brain injury recovery because the damage was so severe that I could not walk, I could not walk. I did not know who I was or who you were, my mother, my father, my wife, my daughter. And it took three years to rebuild synapses in the brain to make up for the damage on the left. Now, remember, the left frontal part was the part that successfully ran my whole company for 20 years. I had to shut the whole company down lay everybody off, stop making any new money, and be in recovery for three years. So I want people to understand that sometimes it can take that long or longer. Because it took three years before the hospital said, oh, well, we're going to let you go now. You're fine. But I was not fine. I was not all I could be. I was, I was fine enough to be looking sort of normal. But I could not drive yet. And there's much I could not do. Well, it took five years, two more years, before my daughter 
a very sensitive one, remember, because she's bipolar, for she said, oh, now you're the same father. But the biggest learning I had, and then I will stop this experience, was in that first week, trying to walk along metal bars, I discovered that while the body was not able to do anything that I could choose, yes, the heart was working and the lungs were working, but nothing was functional. So I couldn't be a speaker. I couldn't be a father. I couldn't be a lover. I couldn't be. I couldn't play tennis. I couldn't do anything that the body likes to do. But I discovered inside the body, in the center, where we have what science knows are chakras, the center of our my body and your body, I discovered is fine. My core, my soul, my spirit, whatever you want to call it, is 100% light and love and energy and consciousness, just like I discovered up in the source of the white light. And it all comes down and it enters our eighth chakra and into our entire body at all levels. And therefore, I learned that when I look at you or anyone, I no longer see a face that looks different than mine, a gender that looks different than mine, an accent that sounds different than mine. I just see another soul who is 100% light and love, just like I am at the core. And everything else that happens in the body and everything else that's imperfect about me and you is, so what? <laughs> it just... It's just part of the learning experience and it's part of the recovery and it's part of being and doing whoever we are. But at the core, the soul is not killed. The soul is not traumatized. The body is. And what an amazing learning. No matter what else is happening, I am. And I'm fine. And I am pure light and love. Okay. So what's the third thing you needed to learn? Well, in 2020, only three years ago, I discovered I had cancer. And it was already stage three cancer. So the cancer was starting to spread. And I was told there would need to be surgery. And I said, no. I don't want surgery. I want to see if it's possible to kill the cancer. Not only with Western medicine called chemotherapy and radiation, both of which are extremely damaging to the entire immune system and to the body. I caught the first COVID virus from the nurse giving me the chemotherapy on the 16th after a week when I had trouble breathing. So I left and I spent 10 days above my body having many experiences. I was on the surface of a three-dimensional dome with hexagonal, that means six sides, hexagonal sections and all of us who were in ICU then were up there with me. And one morning, they somebody came and with a key unlocked these hexagonal sections in which we were all hanging with all four limbs tied to the corners, just like they had been tied in the bed. So we would not pull tubes out of every opening in our body including the extra openings that they made, okay? So I was all alone now for the last night, all alone on this room. And this is a very weak metaphor, but just picture you're trying to hold yourself up on these bars. And when you're young and strong, you can pull yourself up. But if you can't, you still have to hang on. Because... These bars weren't a foot off the ground. They were all the way in the light. 
In other words, I had to hang on in order to live. And I chose to make sure that I do not let go. I did have the opportunity to let go. And I was not afraid of dying, as I know mine is pure light. But I had to live to come back and love my wife and my children, who I love. And because of the damage that is happening in our country, and by white men, all too often against black men or Asians or anybody else, all my diversity work had not ended. I must return and continue my work. And so with the help of angels and with the help of doctors and the help of my wife, right? I'm not claiming I did it alone. The part I did that I want you to learn is that the part we all have, we can choose as I had chosen to recover, I'm now choosing to live, not pass, with help. But I remember coming into my body again, like tight rubber gloves that you have to put on until they're completely on. And then I'm in a bed, live, but with machines and tubes everywhere. And it took three months of my inability to leave the bed with all these tubes. And I lost 60 pounds. And I couldn't even move my own body left and right and had to move it for me. And I was afraid when they leaned me up to stand on the edge of the bed. I was afraid I'd fall. So I had to go through another long recovery period. In one year before I could breathe oxygen without a machine. And now every breath I take is a gift and enough for this moment. And everything else, remember, is just fine, even though it's not all pleasant and I have to learn more. So that's, and those are my three near deaths and those are my three learnings. And what makes me grateful right now to just be alive and breathing and with you. And I thank also all of you who have been listening and watching. Um, I, I hope you have learned something that you can use because I love the phrase, take what you can use and leave the rest. Meaning, even if you only liked 10% of what I'm sharing, great, that's enough. <laughs> 